Mr. Lerscher, thank you very much for uh, being with us here today. Um, if we could start off, as Dean Salona said, you've worked in many different countries across the world and worked in many different businesses. Perhaps we could start by asking, are there some common threads that you've identified with all of the leaders that you've met that you would say define leadership for you? I think there are many, many definitions of, uh, of leaderships around the world, so I will not be the one who will add another one. <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, if you think about, uh, maybe we, sh we can talk a little bit in terms of what, uh, what I personally consider as, as, as key traits of, uh, of good leaders. I think the first one I would say is uh, clarity of direction and vision. Second one is, and that's the, probably a skill in itself, that how you break it then down in actionable steps short-term, medium, and long-term, which is then linked to the capacity of the organization and to your competitive environment what you're facing. So that you challenge the organization, that you challenge the environment, but you make the possible possible in the fastest time what you can and what you're able to implement. So how you execute well in this regard. The third one I would say is that you have to be absolutely Passionate, because without passion you will not be able to rally your teams behind you. Uh, the fourth one I would say you, you have to be absolutely determined in pursuing what you have set out for the organization. And for me, um, one, the fifth one is, I would say, is that you have to have a true north for yourself, irrespective of, 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 con of company values or company culture, that you clearly define for yourself what's right and what's wrong. And then you are onto the field to play. <laughs> <laughs> and, and onto the field, you were, as Dean Slow said, the first outside CEO in, in Siemens history. Um, I imagine that created some specific leadership challenges for you. Perhaps you could talk about these principles that you mentioned and how you applied those as you took over as CEO and president of Siemens. I mean, is, uh, who has actually read and worked through the case? Can you just show me my hands up? Well, I don't have to explain anything to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's, it's, it was a very defining moment for the company. It was a very defining moment for myself. I mean, I was the 12th CEO in the history of the company, the first one coming from the outside. And uh, the, the company itself was in a major, in a major shock. Uh, so the first thing what I had to do is, is, is really to make sure uh, that what happened to the organization was never part of the company culture. So the first thing what I set out for the organization to clearly differentiate that we had a major leadership crisis to deal with, to deal with and to tackle with, but it was not a company culture issue per se what we had to deal with. So for me, to resolving this, uh, this issue in the fastest possible time was obviously the highest priority. Uh, the second one is, is then when you are the first one coming from the outside in, a, in this way onto the, uh, uh, onto the management board is that, you know, there's, I mean, it's the, the natural things. I mean, who is this person? I, I didn't have uh, a broad following in Germany because I spent all my life across the world. So the first question was actually, who is he? Uh, the second question probably was, will he bring his own team with, uh, with him? Will he change everything what we have done in the past? Will he try to revolutionize the company or not? Uh, so I very clearly set out and said, uh, Siemens doesn't need a revolution, but we will continue to have an evolution, but we will do this with speed, 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 speed. Uh, so the third element was uh, then to tackle the first crisis, what I had what I really had to deal with, and this is this whole corruption case and how to make sure that we deal with it in, a, in an extremely forceful, transparent and open manner. And I knew that I had to bring in uh, people from the outside to help me in this one. So my first key appointments in the organization were absolutely critical, and this was Peter Solmson, the chief legal counsel who worked with me in GE, uh, and then also the chief compliance officer, so that I had actually a team onto there who I can clearly trust and who can really work with the overall organization to tackle this most pressing issue that we have to deal with. And then, 
uh, you very quickly move on uh, to, to really say, I wanted to have 100 days. I wanted to have 100 days for the simple reason that I wanted to really uh, see as many people as I could, listen, travel around the world, uh, engage the organization from the customer viewpoint, from the different parts of the world, get feedback, get input, and at the same time work then with my top leadership team what has to be changed. And then the whole thing evolved around uh, structural changes, leadership changes, and so on and so forth, and you have read the case, so I don't have to repeat all of it. But the initial part was very much uh, making sure that I'm visible to as many people of the organization as possible. So I had a lot of skip level meetings, for example. I made deliberate efforts that I made big town hall meetings all over the world where I've been on different sites, where, I meet, where I've met the young leaders of the organization, uh, and so on and so forth, that I have really an interaction on a very different level of the organization, and that I also get uh, an input from the customer viewpoint. So a classical day, if you ask me what is a classical day within Siemens, and I think it's probably still valid today, and this is what I have basically developed over many, many, many years. I, I come in into the morning, uh, basically start breakfast with, with a group of customers, uh, followed by meeting with politicians or with single customers on, on big contracts. Then I go into uh, having lunch with the young high potentials, uh, me, me alone and nobody else. Uh, then followed by business reviews, town hall meetings, and then a joint dinner with the top leadership team. And, and if you do this uh, day after day, you get a very, very solid and very quick understanding what are the true issues and what you have to tackle on and what are the most pressing ones, what you have to deal with as a, as a leader and as a leadership team. And as, as Siemens has evolved over the last three years, it has 400,000 people across the world. How do you effect change when you have so many different businesses in so many different countries and so many individual people who you need to persuade and to get on board with the way you're thinking about the company? I mean, the first thing is, is that you have to recognize that you have to rely on many, many other people. So you need to work, number one, with a united top leadership team. So the first issue what you have to deal with is how do you make sure that you really work with your team who you trust and who, you spe and who speaks with one voice in one direction and acts and speaks in the same way. So how do you quickly get basically different change agents in the organization who are really aligned with what you try to ac accomplish in the, uh, in the organization? And for this reason, the change what I've introduced in terms of the CEO principle uh, was exactly this, to absolutely make sure that I had then the leaders in place who I trusted, uh, who who believed in the same vision, who work in the same direction, with the same speed, how, how, how I wanted to change uh, happening in the organization. And then through the principle that I've just announced, and I'm traveling 70% of my time being in front of the organization as much as you can yourself, because there's nothing more important than the personal and direct dialogue with the, with the teams around the world. And as, as you've evolved as a leader, if we broaden it out just beyond Siemens, could you talk perhaps about how your personal style of leadership has evolved over time and as you've encountered different challenges in the different companies you've worked in, how has that caused you to reflect on your personal style of leadership? I think it's a very, I mean, look at this crowd, I always look at all of you, I mean, you are probably, how many nations are here in Stanford? 50 nations. So you see, my, my grandmother is Italian, my parents are Austrians, my wife is Spanish, two of my children are Americans, the third one is Spanish, and I'm Austrian, so I have learned. <laughs> I have learned to be a minority, and I've learned to actually have a very acute cultural sense. Uh, and this is very important, because the world is very different. And when you then have uh, the big opportunity, what I got early on in life, in life to work in Asia, to study in Asia, in the US and in, in European countries, you, you not just broaden your, your, your skill set, uh, you hone your instincts and you also realize that, uh, that there are many, many avenues to reach a certain goalpost. Uh, and you know all of this, so I don't have to uh, really repeat it, but uh, if I give you three examples, I mean, in the US, everybody knows that you can lead very much by, 
objective setting, vision setting, objective setting, and then you basically work your plan and the people will very much align themselves in doing so. And when you then go to, to Spain, for example, uh, do we have Spanish colleagues here? Yeah, many. So the first thing what you realize is that you have to allow far more time for talking. <laughs> So when you try to align the organization, the first principle what you have to adhere to is that you allow the teams to really, that they have a good talk among themselves. And then this is how you create alignment. But it's very, very important that you give this. You cannot just uh, set it from the, from the top and say, this is what we will do, and this is how it looks like, and these are the action steps, and I ask you to follow. Because they won't. But you get a very strong buy-in if, if you do it the other way around. Uh, when you then go to Asia, you have a very similar type of uh, uh, leadership requirement. You, you must make sure that you, that you engage the organization from a bottom-up perspective and then align it in different initiatives, top-down and bottom-up. Uh, so and this is the privilege that I had in my life that I grew up in, in different cultural environments, I worked in different environments, and this helped me a lot in terms of how I appreciate the diversity of the world and also uh, how to be most effective in cross-cultural teams, uh, which is the true asset of a global company like ours. And if we talk about, you have such a large, a large organization, you talked about the young leaders that you have. I think for a group of high potential leaders like us. Perhaps you could talk about... <laughs> By the way, this is exactly what I assume, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. <laughs> but let's talk about the other side of that. What do you think are the most common mistakes that you see young leaders in your organization make, and what could we learn from those mistakes? Oh, this is a very broad question. Look, I mean, the first, the first advice what I would have is, I mean, all of you are leaders, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But I think as leaders, being young or older, the first thing what we have to recognize is how privileged we are. And I give you now a quote, what, what was a great learning for me, from Jack Welch. I met Jack in the mid-90s through a benchmarking exercise. When I then joined uh, the GE organization, he was on his book tour. And I met him in his signing with his uh, latest books. So I said, Jack, I'm here, I'm now officer of GE. What is your one line of advice? You know what he gave me, one line of advice? Peter, give it all, Jack. And I think live your dreams and make sure that you live up to the, to the capacity and to what you have as individuals and make a real contribution through the work that you do for others. And I think this is the great privilege what we have. This is what, what leaders have to think of in terms of what is their impact, not just from an from a, from a economic perspective, but also ecological perspective, social perspective, and the impact what we have for, for many, many millions of people. And for me, it was always a great privilege. I spent many, many years of my life in the pharmaceutical uh, business uh, for a very simple reason, because I, I was enormously privileged to work on technologies and help people to live a better life and to survive. And when you then talk to patients and you feel really the impact what you have, this makes me very, very proud of. Um, and that's a great privilege of being the CEO of Siemens, being in so many businesses. This is, this is really the impact what, the, what a big organization like ours have is enormous. And that's an enormous, enormous privilege. But I, I guess with that privilege becomes a lot of responsibility in leaders. And when, when you look at these high potential leaders, you mentioned you have lunch with them many days. I think a lot of us feel that we learn the most when we struggle and when we face challenges. Perhaps you could talk a little bit more about when, when you, you talk to these leaders, what are the challenges that they are dealing with? Because these, I think, are the challenges that, that we might face in the next two to three years. I always tell my team, look, I mean, when I look into this room here, how many of you will join big global organizations like Siemens? <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. And that's the reality. You want to become entrepreneurs, 
uh, you look for very different uh, uh, fulfillments in your life. I mean, when I was at Harvard and, uh, and we were talking about what were, when you go through the last 20 years, I mean, it was 20 years ago, it was probably, you know, it was the issue. At one point, there was the big organizations. Then there was the whole wave of the consultancies. Then there was the big wave of, of the financial industry. Uh, and the most, uh, most promising uh, perspective right now is to be real entrepreneurship. So making it for yourself and create something for yourself. And, and, and you are here in your backyard, Silicon Valley. And I was quite impressed, as I learned from the dean actually two minutes ago, that 40% of you will actually start to work there. That's great. So for a big organization like Siemens, it is very, you are not waiting till you are middle-aged and gray. There's somebody in life will tell you, and now you're fully responsible. You are asking for the responsibility far earlier than any generation before you. You also have an enormous privilege, like all of us, when we compare the change what is now happening in the world, being it technological change, being it uh, the global change which is happening, it is happening in one management generation. The type of change which used to happen within three. So there's an, an enormous compressed way of opportunity. There's an enormous opportunity space. So big organizations have to make sure how they are attractive for a young population like yourself who is asking for broader experience and more responsibility far earlier than any other management generation before you. And that's the challenge and that's uh, the type of opportunity space which big companies have to face. And when we look at this, this next generation of leaders, how do you think the challenges that they will face as leaders, you've talked about them having more responsibility earlier, but how do you see the other challenges they face as leaders as being different from, from the current generation and from generations before them? I think, as I said it, I mean, the big change is, uh, if you just talk about the globalization which is currently happening in the world, it's, it's with a speed which is enormous. I grew up, for example, in my first studies I studied in Austria. And the Iron Curtain was actually just happening in the backyards of Vienna. And I was crossing this, this Iron Curtain several times. I could not imagine, really, I could not imagine that I will ever see in my life that this would change. This for me was something which was given. And look what happened just through this one thing, how the world has changed. Now we are going through a major crisis and we see all of a sudden the political architecture changing dramatically. Going from a G7, G8 to a G20, the emerging markets, they are asking for far more uh, responsibility, not just economically but also politically. When you then look where 97% of incremental population growth will happen, it will happen in the emerging economies. So there is, uh, and they want to have the same way and uh, opportunity space than we have in our, in our lifespan, sitting here in, uh, at the university. So the change, what you have, and the impact I would not like to talk in terms of challenges, but the opportunities what you have is the impact, what Friedman was talking about, you know, a flat world, which is absolutely a reality right now, the impact what new technology can bring in terms of mass impact is in a way democratized like never before. And this creates an enormous new opportunity space for each one of you and uh, find your space, go for it, and make an impact. And make an impact economically, but also socially and community-wise. And I think this is exactly what, what this opportunity space is. And I think in order to do that, all of us have benefited from mentors in our life to provide us guidance and to help us understand the potential that exists for us. You mentioned Jack Welch earlier. Are there any particular mentors that you've had? And what do you think were the most important things you learned from them? I mean, my f first of all, I didn't have them. I, mean, I don't go back and say this was one mentor, which was great. But you learn from each one of the people you interface with. Uh, maybe one, maybe one story, which was for me very, 
very, very telling. Uh, when I was 27 years of age, I, I joined a big German company called Höchst at that time. It was a big chemical company. And the CEO was, used, to be my, used to be my mentor and he hired me and I was, he said, look, start working, work your six months and then come back and then let's talk about how, what you would like to do within, within our organization. <laughs> and I had my one page and I was clearly mapping it out, what I would like to do and this and this and, this. and he, I showed up in his office and then he was listening uh, two minutes and then he turned it away and said, you know, I give you an advice. Have fun, enjoy the things what you're doing, and make sure the people you work with are equally enjoyable. And then everything what we have written here will happen automatically. And that's a great advice. Because never try to plan any career. Never try to chart, but whatever you do, try to do it in the best possible way and then go for it. It's a great advice what I got from, for myself. And as, as you've become a senior leader... And by the way, at that time, my ambition level was to become the CEO of Höchst Austria. <laughs> <laughs> as, um, as I guess you are perhaps now a mentor to other people in your organization, could you perhaps talk about how you feel playing that role now as being a mentor to that next generation of leaders? And yeah, this is very important. I mean, when you ask me what is one of the most rewarding aspects what I, what I spend time with is really, uh, we have now introduced uh, a new mentoring scheme for, uh, for all the board members, for all my colleagues as well, uh, where I have uh, basically 15 <coughs> mentees uh, all across the world with different backgrounds and we rotate them every two years. So they're mentees for two years and then they are rotated to the next. Uh, and this is for me extremely rewarding. So I work very, very closely and, and, and you know, the mentee is responsible for the, for the mentor relationship. It works in different ways, it is very personal and I try to provide feedback to them, give them advice from my experience and also at the same time get to know what, where, where their challenges are and to make sure that uh, the right steps are taken uh, uh, and that they are stretched in the right possible way within the organization. So the mentee-mentor relationship is, is, is something which is enormously enjoyable for me personally and I spend quite a significant part of my time to make sure that I stay in, in touch with them and uh, that we have a continuous dialogue. And before we open it to questions, uh, one last theme that we've seen in the last five years is a much closer tie between business and government. What has been your experience of that trend and how do you think that's likely to evolve in the next five to ten years? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, there's well, uh, it's absolutely true, number one, particularly for big infrastructure companies like ourselves. When you think about a big company like Siemens, which at the end of the day, our whole business is infrastructure at the end of the day, being medical infrastructure, being energy infrastructure, uh, or, or building now with Master City, the next generation of a city environment. Uh, so all of it is, is, is really big infrastructure programs. And, and, and there you have, at one side, you face uh, governments as regulators, you face government as customers, uh, the whole stimulus programs uh, as part of the, uh, what we have seen during the crisis. Uh, so absolutely. The, uh, and then you have, you know, economists who are, in, uh, who are very closely linked between uh, infrastructure development programs and the political agenda around the world. So there's a very close alignment. It's getting closer and it's a very important one, for, particularly for a company like ourselves. Well, at this one, I'd like to open it up to questions. We have microphones on either side, so if people could put hands up and we'll get a mic to you. Do you want to, we'll start down here. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you what clean tech opportunities do you see for Latin America? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, I will answer this question, but I will start a little bit broader because it's a very, <laughs> it's a very important question what you're asking. When, you, when, when I joined Siemens, uh, I asked the question, what is our clean tech portfolio? 
and nobody could give me an answer what the clean tech portfolio is. Because it was actually in, in the businesses. In different, you know, there was different solutions, but nobody actually looked across and said, this is our clean tech portfolio, being it renewables or being it energy efficient. Uh, so when we have for the first time lined it up, so I started in, in 2007, I asked this question. By July 2008, we had for the first time actually developed our clean tech portfolio, and it was 17 billion euro. The biggest and broadest clean tech portfolio of any company in the world. In the meantime, we have set out an objective of 25 billion. It will be, we will overachieve it already this year, and we, will, and we are by far the biggest infrastructure company, and this is what I set out as a vision for the company, to be a green infrastructure Pioneer. So that's the major, major strategic emphasis of the company across all business lines to make sure that the next generation of product development are more resource efficient and energy efficient. And when we have the highest speed trains and the highest speed trains uh, are only consuming 0.33 liters per, per 100 kilometers per passenger, then it's the most energy efficient high speed train as well, not just the fastest one. And when you look into the sustainability agenda around the world, it is blatant clear that this is on the highest political priority level. Despite the fact that Copenhagen has not succeeded to bring into any climate change agreement. Uh, but when you talk about the mayors around the world, that 1% of the population are cities of, of square meters are cities consuming 75% of energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions, you know that this is the biggest challenge around the world. And in South and Latin America, and this is all around the world, when you then talk about, uh, and you go from, you talk about the uh, Olympic Games, for example, Brazil, or the Football World Cup, the big, big, and the resort, uh, and the and the infrastructure development programs, which are currently put into, uh, into place, have all the agenda of making sure that the latest generation of infrastructure development is significantly better in terms of sustainable urban infrastructure development programs than any other generation before. So you have this in Latin America equally. I was, for example, last week I was uh, together with Pinero, the president of, uh, of Chile, Again, we have immediately worked on a program, how can actually Chile uh, now introduce the latest technology of clean tech to really make sure that they benefit, for example, of their solar intensity, what they have, and how can they bring together solar programs, uh, that they make sure that in their biggest cities are the mobility infrastructure programs which are now built out with the latest technology far, uh, far more resource um, and uh, co consuming less resource, uh, resources than before. So it's a big, big program across all political scopes, being it in Latin America, being it in this country. I mean, Obama has made a big, big, big uh, push in terms of clean tech being not just, being also a big job engine, uh, how the economy will be revived. If you go to Asia, to, uh, to China, for example, it's, it's a massive government agenda. Uh, so you have it all over the world, and you see also it, and, and you definitely see it also in Latin America. Over the next question. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us, Mr. Loscher. A uh, question that I have for you is the following. Uh, over the past 100 years, uh, the German precise traditional way of doing things has served Siemens very well uh, in developing all this infrastructure that we see. Now we see a bigger trend towards need for innovation and more high speed. How do you manage to, to change that culture and foster this kind of uh, Silicon Valley startup kind of culture inside of such a big company? That's a very important question because uh, uh, at the end of the day is of any company, 90% uh, of the innovation is happening outside the walls of the company. So you, uh, we have a big programs, for example, currently what we call internally open innovation. Historically, our labs, which we have already all over the world, we have one here on the West Coast, we have one in Princeton on the East Coast, we have it in Asia, we have it in Germany, we have it 
uh, in 30 countries around the world where we have research and development activities uh, ongoing currently. A number one, the network will be wider, but historically, our research and developers have very much focused their time on what is happening in their own labs. And now, the focus is shifting, and this is why we call it open innovation, that we make sure where is in all the technology fields which are in our sphere of interest, where are the big partner networks, outside partner networks, where we have to link with to make sure that, that we innovate faster relative to our competitors. So we have a big push basically driving the, uh, the innovation agenda outside our own boundaries, engaging with, with big research institutions or big universities or, or uh, small companies and innovative companies to make sure that we have the most innovative network available to us in the big technology fields which, which are of our interest. That's a, that's a, very, that's a very important push. Uh, it's a very strategic one. And uh, this will be very important because there's nothing uh, more demo uh, democratic than the innovation process around the world. And when you look into where we have big, big in innovative centers are happening, of course it's the United States, but when you just go by sheer size, uh, we have around, if, if I give you the numbers right now, you, you have just graduations, okay? I'm talking about technical graduations. In Germany, we have roughly 45 to 50,000 technical graduates every year. In India, there are, there are around 320,000. In China, you talk about 800,000. The number's a little bit, there's a range between 800,000 and one point and closer to, and closer to a million. Uh, so we see very much the gravity centers of innovation uh, changing, shifting, and uh, we have to take advantage of it to the fact that we are already present in 190 countries of the world and therefore we should have a very good advantage with great reputation in these markets that we are able to tap into these new networks. Can we go with one of the ones in the middle? We get a mic over. And then we have also a venture capital fund internally, you know, we have, uh, where, where for example, uh, the fund is available for, for internal research programs as well as for partner uh, companies as well. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you. Uh, you, you talk here about, uh, at the beginning, you said setting vision and having clarity and strong leadership, and I think very charismatic leadership. But some, in some of our classes here, especially in OB, we learn that sometimes it's good to use the, the, sk the high skills of the group to, to, to set to, set, to be facilitative, to be participative. So how do you balance those two? Yeah, but this is what I'm not saying. I mean, when, uh, this is exactly what I mean. I think at the end of the day, it's always the team, okay? It doesn't matter who is, an individual never really matters as much as any high performance team. And this is why I've also pushed, for example, in the organization for diversity. Uh, I'm on record, as I said, the management is too white, too male, too German well, when, I, when I joined the organization. Because I think you have to tap into the diversity pool what you have as a global organization. Uh, and when you have the great privilege that you are at home in 190 countries of the world, that you're able to attract the best talents, to develop the best talents, uh, talents and make them available uh, for, for the global organization from a team perspective as well as from an individual perspective. Uh, this is a very, very critical element and we have, on top of uh, individual responsibilities, what you would be responsible for, many, many programs where we particularly look into initiatives, corporate initiatives and pulling into these initiatives very diverse teams from all over the world to really help us to drive the change agenda. So that's at the, at the cornerstone uh, of what we try to do, but this is always in the framework of the clarity of vision, what you try to have of an organization. So the teams, they, they really have to work towards the ultimate end uh, uh, of, the, of the focus of the overall organization. But uh, leveraging uh, the, the diversity of team, I mean, I don't have to explain this. This is probably one of the great, great privilege what you have working together. Yeah, do you wanna go? Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is, looking forward to the next 
10 years, what is the single most important strategic issue that you have to face as a CEO and how are you gearing the company to actually address that issue? I th I, it's the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you why. Because uh, as an innovative, as an innovation company, which is an infrastructure company, the innovation cycles of many of our products are going, for example, for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. For example, we are now bringing to the market the most energy efficient gas turbine of the world. Uh, the initial part of the development programs goes back to the early 90s. When we talk about the current high speed train, which we are which we're currently selling, the initial uh, uh, development programs go back to the mid 90s. So when we talk about the innovation agenda to be in, in, innovation leaders in the fields where we have focused on, in the, in the three sectors, we are looking way above the 10 year time horizon. We really have to look into uh, 20 years. You can look from, a, from a, how you implement in terms of this, the different strategies, you can look five to 10 years. But when they then say, okay, what is our innovation advantage? What we would like to see in this area? The time horizon is way, way longer than uh, the 10 years. So we set out as, uh, uh, as the strategic direction for the company being the green infrastructure pioneer. So the pioneering spirit, what you have read in the, in the uh, in the case is very much at the forefront what we try to drive. So there's a big innovation agenda in, the, in, in all areas. This is not a single business field what we're looking for, but we're looking for to really making sure that the energy efficiency of all products going forward are significantly more energy efficient and that we drive the organization towards tailor-made solutions for big, big customers. For example, which are not in the, in, the, in the forefront of a classical Siemens customer. A classical Siemens customer uh, would be if there is a tender, if, if there is Palo Alto or anywhere else, and they would say there's a great tram, but we would now like to develop, and there's a tender process, and then we would be off and running uh, to going after the tender. But to engage Master City and to say, what can we drive together to help you to implement the vision of a CO2-free city environment? And what can we, from a technology perspective, to implement, to link together the energy smart grid infrastructure with the smart building infrastructure that all the energy consumption which is happening in the city is able to communicate with each other and, and being optimized in terms of the energy efficiency of buildings, uh, of energy flows across the city and therefore ultimately help to drive massively down the energy costs of master city. This is a, an innovation partnership what we are now pulling together with master city. Classically, there's no tender in this context, but there is a, a big, big strategic alliance where we work together with Master City to really drive it. And that's at the forefront what Siemens is all about. Or Desatec, where we basically drive to harness uh, the sun of Africa, uh, not just for, uh, for the African countries themselves, but also ultimately being available for importing towards Europe, is a big vision, which is 10 to 15 years out, where we work with an innovation partnership together with the governments of Africa and with the European Union. What is the right funding which is required? What is the technology which is already today available? High voltage direct current technology so that we can transmit energy without any losses over long periods of time. So the big, big programs, uh, which are infrastructure programs going beyond one customer, much more into a strategic alliance and innovation partnership is the big, big lever for the organization going forward. And this is where we drive the strategic impact of Siemens versus just selling products and services and being attentive to tenders, which we ultimately obviously have to do in all our business lines. Sorry, sorry quick follow-up question. I, I see that vision. 
Can you talk to us just quickly about how you translate that vision into execution by breaking it down into those tactical steps? So the tactical, so the vision is the vision of master city was a vision of the Abu Dhabi government. So I engaged very much at the top level of the political environment of Abu Dhabi to say, let's pull together a small team of your people who are responsible for Master City under the leadership of Dr. Sultan, who is the CEO of Master City and our team. So the two of us then pulled an operational team together of, the, of creating the strategic alignment. We worked for 18 months because you have to really break it down. What is the requirements of the city? How is the layout of the city? What are the different steps of phase one and phase two? It's now slightly delayed because of the impact of the current crisis, but they're continuing with the vision. So we worked for 18 months and a week ago, I was able to sign it in London. This is how we have worked into broken it down with a very specific initiative ultimately being able to be signed. Okay, we've got one over here. You uh, said earlier one of your five values of leadership was, um, was to have a true north that transcends company values, company norms. Could you talk to us about your true north, how you came to that true north, um, and yeah, what, why that is your true north? I think this comes back, uh, I say, a true north uh, because it goes back the first environment where you really uh, learn about it are the values within your family. And the first role model for me personally was my own father. And then you have a lot of opportunities and privileges like of a university like Stanford University where you probably have a lot of leaderships in terms of ethics, ethical behavior and business ethics. Uh, and I for this reason for example have actually sponsored a, also a, a, an educational initiative at the Technical University of Munich uh, to, to really provide these aspects uh, at at the university level, because at the end of the day, this goes back to families, the values of the families, and the values of the education where you were brought up with. And then, many of you, I assure you, many of you in your life will be faced in one way or another to make a personal decision. Do I do something or I don't? In different contexts. You know, sometimes are cultural norms, others are uh, where you say, and then you have to say, no, I live up to my own standard with my own norm and I'm not willing to go for it. For example, this whole primary case in Siemens, when you read the testimonies of people, this is why I said this was a leadership crisis. This was not the cultural crisis of the company, but this was a leadership <laughs> attitude of some leaders who have decided a red line for me is not a red line. And when you then look into the testimonies, what they have given, the classical testimony is, well, I have done it to the benefit of the company. Come on. People were pursuing this because they had sales incentives as well. And ultimately, they have made the incentive schemes. So this is what I mean. It, you don't have to talk about company values. This is the next level where you then have, obviously, and I would very much encourage you, whatever organization you, you join, is make sure how are the company values, not as values, but how are they actually lived? Who are the role models of the organization? And who are the role models of leaders? And can you relate to them? And if somebody asks you, the, the most dangerous thing what you will encounter is, I have to do things because everybody does. And it's up to each one of you to decide to say, no, I don't do it, period, full stop. And this is what I mean at True North. I have also encountered this in my professional life, for sure. We go to the next question, we've got one at the back over there. Uh, sir, you spoke about the 
um, how young people are asking for more responsibility at an earlier and earlier age. Um, for that model to work, that means young people have to be able to accept and succeed in, with this more responsibility. So I wonder from your point of view, do you believe that the skills and abilities of young people are changing commensurately with their changes in expectations and desires? What do you think about this, about you here? I think, uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think it comes back to your point about feeling privileged. And I think sometimes it's important to recognize when we are feeling privileged. And so some, you know, sometimes this leads to an expectation that we deserve more. But I also feel, and I'm biased, that, that we are capable of doing great things. So I wonder from an executive's point of view, how you look at young talent that come into your company and hunger for, you know, for the next step that are two steps ahead of them. And are they ready for that? I watch very closely one thing. I watch very closely in terms of what, how people are performing in their current jobs. And my alarm bells are going on if people continuously talk about the next step. In some instances, it's probably very right. And then the question is, is a person in a job who is too small for him? Or is he able to actually stretch himself, him or herself, at a higher level? But it's very dangerous if you try to do things where you do things with the anticipation, I have a right of this and that and that. And, and this is a very, very valuable question what you ask, a very important one. And to find the right balance can only be given at an individual basis. Uh, but never look out. Doing things in a certain way today because I expect something from the organization tomorrow. I think this can never work and will never work. Uh, rather try to look into, find an environment where you have a mentorship and a leadership environment where you can engage yourself and leverage yourself early on as part of a great performing team. Because early on in life, <coughs> The biggest lever what you have is the high performance team aspect, which was asked earlier here. Uh, it's not the individual. It's actually the team environment. And then you will drive on it. Uh, it's, the question can only be asked individually, but it's a very, very important question what you have asked. We have time for one more question. So, One at the back there. Just over. No. Anyways, just a practical question that has the story about the uh, that Stuxnet computer virus, and if that's still an ongoing issue, and if it had caused you to reevaluate potential threats to your business. I think it was the Stuxnet computer. Virus. Oh, the Stuxnet. The Stuxnet is a great business opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Because now many industrial companies have realized the danger of being actually part of a, of a portable computer or of a computer environment. And we produce in our automation control division actually proprietary uh, solutions. And uh, since Stuxnet ha has hit the, the drive to the little bit more expensive <laughs> proprietary solution from Siemens, the demand is going up. <laughs> But it's a serious danger. I mean, uh, you have now asked about the danger. Absolutely, it is a danger. There's no question. And uh, we have now more and more customers who are looking into their in industrial control environments to really make sure where are weak points. So we are doing a lot of so-called health checks for many of our customers uh, at this moment in time because uh, this has obviously created a much heightened awareness compared to before. So, Lucia, I'd like to say thank you very much for attending the GSB today. We really appreciate you being here. All the best to you.